Again, this is our monthly, almost every month, um, Rami on the Menu. We have history talks, presentations, informal. If you go on Oral History of Rami, West Virginia, on YouTube, you'll see a whole slew of so many different ones. And tonight we are uh, having, I kept calling it the Opera Houses because that's what they called it, but here we have theaters of Rami. And when I contacted Rick, or when we got in touch with each other, he had said, gosh, I've, I've been finding out so many wonderful things about uh, some of the industries in Romney, and he has a theater background, so that kind of tweaked his interest, and he says, but I don't have enough for an hour. <laughs> well, lo and behold, a couple months later, he's got so much, he's going to split it into two. <laughs> so we're, we've got part one tonight, and I'm trying to pin him down on when he's going to do part two, but the good news is, is Ken will probably be our official guru of the uh, video and make sure that it goes on line so that we can see it even if you miss it. Um, I'm going to introduce Rick Schneider to you and let him run with it. If you have other information that you want to say to him, like Ooh, you might find more information here, I'm technically supposed to be writing it down, so make sure that you get it to me and I don't hear it all, okay? With no, without further ado, Rick. Thank you, thank you. Good evening. Um, again, um, I'm Rick Schneider. I'm doing uh, Theaters of Romney for Romney on the Menu. It's February 21st, 2020. And this is part one, as uh, we've just been hearing. There's just a lot of material to cover. Um, as Carol said, when I first started talking about this topic, I was concerned that I wouldn't have enough material even for a full hour. Uh, then I really started getting into the topic. I spent a lot of time going through microfilm at the, of the Hampshire Review in the Romney Public Library. Um, I spent a day at the Library of Congress in Washington and a day at Shepherd's College in Shepherdstown. And then a couple of weeks ago, I learned, as many of us did, that the Hampshire Review, the early years up to 1924, had finally been digitized and put online. Well, that totally opened up the possibility of really doing research and being able to search names and places and titles and subnames and peripheral names and so on and really getting into it and finding out all, all kinds of useful information. Um, so um, I, I decided that not to uh, reduce the material, to squeeze it into an hour and a half, but to split it up. That seemed to make the most sense. So basically tonight we're doing like from the beginning to the 1930s. And the next time, whenever that is, will be from the 1930s to the present. Um, basically what I was trying to do is um, take a look at uh, sort of the whole um, holistic approach to it, entertainment and Romney, as it were. Um, if you have anything to add tonight, uh, please speak out. Um, I consider this to be a work in progress, even though tonight's this presentation, uh, my, there's still things I want to research on this topic. And um, so if you have any suggestions of other places where to look or things that you may have, or if you, we, you and I should get together and talk about things, that'll be great. Uh, one technical note about a lot of these slides, the dates that are posted on most of these slides are the publication dates from the Hampshire Review. Other publications that'll cross, pop up uh, are from the South Branch Intelligencer and the tablets from the West Virginia Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Uh, I, I can't read it too easily here, but um, I broke this up into a couple of different sections. Um, it's not as onerous as it seems. A lot of these sections are pretty short. Um, but again, I, I try to break it up into logical parts and not have just a totally strict chronology. Don't worry about these titles. You'll see them as they come up from section to section. Okay, so we begin here. Entertainment in Romney before 1914. You'll soon see why 1914 is a pivotal year. But before we get there, we're going to look at entertainment in the Romney area. Long before there were movies, there were stage performances, and whether they were called plays or opera or vaudeville or burlesque, they were all live performers on stage. Before about 1880, most performing arts were done by some kind of stock company where the titles changed, but the performers did not. But about 1880, the idea of traveling shows took hold. The industry became more organized, and almost every town and city in America had its theater. Romney did not. 
The closest theaters to Romney were in Cumberland, which as a big city would be expected. The closest small town theater was in Moorfield, West Virginia. Here in 1885, an announcement was made for uh, predicting the building of an opera house. Romney did not follow suit. Here we're finally getting to uh, local events and the arts in Romney, a singing society. The first piece of entertainment news I found in the Hampshire Review was this notice about a Professor Schaefer who wanted to convert his singing school into a musical society whose object would be the musical culture and education of young people through singing. Now if you're trying to create a new music institution, this next piece is probably not very helpful. Drop dead while singing. <laughs> That's what it says. On Friday afternoon, about 1 o'clock, while Professor Schaefer was giving the choir at the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Institution their usual lesson, James Snodgrass gave a groan and fell to the floor. It seems he had heart disease, even though he was only 24 years old. Well, that probably should say Castanet, possibly Romney's first official band. Every town had one, just ask the music man. It's not unusual for a small town newspaper to publish a note like this. The girl's name was Ethel. Preparing for the stage. How did that work out for her? She decided not to enter the theatrical profession. <laughs> Evidently, not so much. Okay. The circus is coming. Before there were staged events, the traveling circus was big business. There were many companies, and Romney was a regular stop on the tours. Here is an announcement for the Adam Forpo show. It contains 21 double freight cars, two circus rings, and a grand hippodrome track. This is the display ad that ran in the paper. Two performances on Saturday, May 5th, 1894. The show included a horse that walks a tightrope, a talking horse, trained elephants, and much more. <clears throat> there was a grand parade in town, and there were employment opportunities for local people for help as the circus advertised for 50 young men for spectacular purposes. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> a week later, we got a review in the paper. While it did attract a large crowd, the critic felt that the circus was nothing extraordinary, but some of it was very clever. A year later, John Robinson's Big Show came to town. Ten big shows combined. They appeared at the circus grounds, wherever that was, a thousand people and 500 horses, and the largest snake alive, 25 feet long. It dines on pigs, sheep, turkeys, and dogs. <laughs> the first mention of a film in Romney was in 1903. Motion pictures were basically invented in the late 1890s, and the commercial movie industry grew explosively in the first years of the 20th century. By 1905, there were theaters and Nickelodeons all over the country. This is a presentation by the Lyman Howe Exhibition Group. According to Wikipedia, Lyman Howe was an American entertainer, motion picture exhibitor, and early filmmaker. He entered the entertainment industry in 1883, began touring with a photograph in 1890, and showed his first movies in 1896. He was the first person to use a photograph for background sound effects in movies. He frequently came to Romney with his exhibitions. Here he presents a most potent magnet to all admirers of clean and wholesome amusement, as it does all over the country. The Review of Lyman Howe's Entertainment. A large audience was present and the entertainment was greatly enjoyed. Howe returned to Romney frequently, including November of 1906. Note two articles in this week's paper side by side. Location of event, the Institution Chapel. Tickets cost 50 cents, 35 cents, and 20 cents. Another show at the chapel. Here, 4,000 feet of instructive comic and interesting pictures. Mr. Moore, the popular and well-known baritone, will sing the latest illustrative songs of the day. Apparently, a full evening's entertainment. It seems the institution was perhaps capitalizing on the showing of films to the public. Here, for the only time I have found, an advertisement in the review. No details, but the fact that it was upfront about it is remarkable for the time. Based on the frequency the institution chapel was used for film presentations, 
it might be said that the first theater in town was actually the chapel. But was the institution hall a different place? Don't know. And more. The institution chapel seemed the place to go for shows of all types. Here appearances by Miss Grace Walters, the classic dancer, and Madame Aurora Satan, a noted southern contralto. Here Miss Walters, as the other prominent interpretive dancers, discards the usual coverings for the nether limbs, but there is nothing immodest in her performance. <laughs> One more circus to look at. This is the ad, but in the review a week later, it was noted that the large lion, which always resists the trainer's entrance to the arena, killed the trainer's sister about 18 months ago. <laughs> the other animal act in which a woman performs with leopards and pomas was also a dangerous one and was well staged. Says the critic, the remainder of the show was also good. <laughs> was there a Nickelodeon theater before the Opera House? There is some information that says yes, but very little supporting evidence. What little there is to go on is this article from yesterday's review from February 1997. Let's take a close look at the relevant part. Um, just to read it in case you can't. There was another older theater, Miss Pugh, can hardly recall, back when she was very young, that cost a nickel a ticket, called the Nickelodeon. It was located on the corner of Main and High Streets, on, this, uh, on the site of the present um, atrium vacuum cleaner store in the same building where the most recent theater, the Alpine, which opened around 1939 to 1940, was also housed. The Nickelodeon's door opened on the east side of the building, now a vacant lot. The show was upstairs. No information about this theater, no other information about this theater has yet been found. So, this suggests that there was another theater. In particular, Ms. Pugh recalled that the show was upstairs. But note, even this article acknowledged that no other information has been found. To pursue this mystery, I looked for contemporaneous reporting. But I can tell you right off, in eight lines of text, there are four errors. But let's start with the evidence that the Nickelodeon really existed. Just what I was looking for. The Pancake Building, named for a prominent local family, is what we now call the Alpine Building a newspaper notice of the intention to build a theater. And note, we'll use the second floor for moving pictures. And here, this piece from the tablet from January of 1914. Again, upper story. This seems to be Miss Pugh's recollection. These two articles conclude the evidence that there were plans to build a Nickelodeon theater. Next, we look at evidence that the theater really did exist and really did open for business. Nothing. <laughs> Besides those two notices that there were plans to build a movie theater, there was never any follow-up. There are no announcements that the theater was coming, or was opening. There was never any kind of advertisement in the review that any films were being shown. I've never found a closing notice or that it was going out of business. Nothing. So what happened to all those plans? The Pancake Building, located at the corner of Main and High Street, across from the courthouse, underwent several changes of hands around this time. Rather than flashing up many newspaper articles on this matter, I extracted the relevant parts and showed them here. Follow me on this. Um, sorry, it's hard to read, but basically, um, the theater underwent several hands. It was bought and sold several times. It was foreclosed on. It was auctioned off in front of the courthouse. And it was bought and sold, and so on and so forth. Um, and it would appear, quite possibly, that while there were plans to build an, a theater on the second floor of that building, they never came to fulfill. Possibly, with all the uh, buying and selling and auctioning and foreclosing going on, they gave up trying to build in that building. Now at this point, I'm going to interrupt this story, but stay tuned, we're going to come back to it. Let's make it up. Says Theater, at last. This is the very first official verifiable mention of an actual theater in Romney that I have found. It was printed in the Hampshire Review on January 28, 1914. From the plain language of the notice, it sounds like the theater is already open for business. I checked and double-checked the date, and January 1914 is correct. 
Is this just a very premature announcement of a future theater? Finally, we get some specific information. August 5th, 1914. Some eight months after the previous notice, we get some real details. First, note that the place is described as a room. The new building is described as going to be 30 feet by 100 feet. Also, the building is described as going to be only 16 feet high. But this means no second floor, so no upstairs room. And of course, as anyone familiar with what eventually became the Opera House, the building as built was much more than 16 feet high. I did do a title search at the courthouse, but I could not find any deed showing a transfer of land from Zimmerman to Wegman. If you're not sure where the Rocky Mercantile store was, here you go. It eventually became the Green Palm Restaurant. The notice referred to a lot on Main Street adjoining the store of the Romney Mercantile Company. The old buildings on the lot have been torn down. So let's take a closer look. The Sanborn Map Company was a publisher of detailed maps of U.S. cities and towns on the 18th, on the, in the 19th and 20th centuries. The maps were originally created to allow fire insurance companies to assess their liability in urbanized areas of the United States. <coughs> they contain detailed information about properties and individual buildings in approximately 12,000 U.S. cities and towns. Here, Romney in 1899. To start, right in the center is the courthouse, right here. Um, here we have the courthouse lane and Grub Lane eventually became Main Street, and here's High Street, right? It's very courthouse. Next, we're going to zoom in. We're going to zoom in on this block. This is the block, and here's Literary Hall, and the courthouse would be right here. Moving left are a couple of stores, the wooden buildings that Workman is going to tear down, and on the corner, the Romney Mercantile Company. We move on to 1915. Once again, the courthouse is where it always is. And moving to the left on Main Street, we can see the theater has now been built, says Motion Pictures. Uh, let's take a closer look. We move it a little closer and rotate the image so it's easier to read the labels. In this view at the top, where the Green Palm Restaurant would be to, uh, later on, is the Romney Mercantile Store. The theater is shown as motion pictures. There's a line at the right which perhaps indicates the demarcation for the stage inside the building. Across the alley is a bakery, and below that is a barbershop, a millinery, and a drugstore. We move on to 1923. Did I say the courthouse never changes? There is a new courthouse in town built in 1922. Now to the left or west of the theater, there's a garage. At the back of the theater, there's some kind of an audition, but there's no way to tell what it was for. And of course, the alley is always still there. Looking for the Nickelodeon, I also looked at the Sanborn maps. This one is from 1908. According to Miss Pugh, the Nickelodeon was located in the same building as the Alpine building, which is there's the courthouse, so this is the Alpine building, um, and the corner across from the courthouse. According to this map, in 1908, the corner building was a general store and warehouse. 1915, 1915 not much more helpful. The building on the corner is now shown as bunch of letters, CLO, BNS, and DG. Could all that stand for clothes, uh, something, I don't know, and then DG dry goods? In the spot that would eventually be the Alpine Theater is a restaurant and kitchen. So for all those people who remember that the old Nickelodeon was across from the courthouse, no, it wasn't. <laughs> now we can pursue once again the Nickelodeon question. Recall this part of the narrative from a few minutes ago. We need to look for the Hampshire garage, and we need to look for a bowling alley. 
And here the second floor issue again. And there it is, Sanborn map. Look on the top left, at the corner of Main Street and Marsham Street, uh, Marsham and High down here, at, um, is what we're looking for. The Hampshire Garage, and right next to it, a bowling alley. And right below that appears to be a vacuum cleaner store, uh, which apparently is what Miss Pugh is recalling. Not sure about that, but I can say now with confidence, this is where the Nickelodeon Theater was located or at least was supposed to be located. What we still cannot resolve is that there's still no evidence that the theater ever actually opened for business. Perhaps we leave that for another day. Spoiler alert. The names of the place was Star Theater, Opera House, Ideal Theater, and Alpine Theater. There's no evidence it was ever called the Pioneer Theater. So what was taking so long to get this place built? Let's go back to this notice from January 1914. Note that the owners and managers are James Wardman and B.F. Bobo. Something happened. By September, Wardman and Bobo split up. The new partner is Jonathan D. Blue. They want the public to continue patronizing them the same as in the past. But what? The theater does not yet exist. Did Bobo run up the bills? not contribute his share of funds? We don't know. But this says they're in the moving picture business together. Okay, one more time to return to the Nickelodeon. Here's one theory about all this. Workman and Bobo were managers of the Nickelodeon. They eventually decided to build a more substantial theater in, uh, in town. It's my own theory and there's no evidence to support it, but it does seem to fit a lot of the jigsaw puzzle pieces together. While Wordman struggles to put his theater open, there were still entertainments in Romney. This film, The Creation, ran for four days in October of 1914, but we don't know where the movie was shown. Was it in the Institution Chapel? Could it have been in the Nickelodeon? There's no admission charge, not even a nickel. About two months after the site was purchased, this item appeared in the tablet. Construction was well underway, though they were still predicting many months before it opened. Now it's December, and according to the bottom paragraph, the building is still not ready. <clears throat> Finally, the theater is finished and has a name. This notice was reprinted in the January 6th paper as well. I put this image here not because this particular photograph was of the opening in 1915, but because even though this image was taken in 1938, we know that this is pretty much what the place looked like in 1915, we think. <laughs> Apparently, the young folks' New Year's Eve party did not count, for this is the very first indication that the theater was open for business and used as a performance space. The preceding Saturday was January 9, so now we officially can say the theater opened for business on January 9, 1914. Note also it appears that the first event was a play, not a film. Still, the Star Theater was not the only game in town. Shows were sometimes presented at local schools. As seen, some of the earliest uses of the theater were for stage plays, not film. That, at least, is according to the limited information we have. In those days, there were no advertisements in the local paper, just these news-like announcements. A couple of things of interest here. The theater was packed. That's always good. The receipts went to graded schools. Not sure which one that was. Most of the talent was local. It seems only Frank S. Davidson toured with the show. The rest are local people. Perhaps of greater importance is that final observation, some better heating arrangements should be made. This is February, after all. <laughs> Uncle Josh was perhaps the hit show of the season, such as it was. We know that this was a touring show, or at least a touring script. We have discovered that it also had played the Bisbee Opera House in Bisbee, Arizona in 1906. 
There too, it was described as the great rural comedy drama. It also played in Clarksburg, West Virginia in, in 1909. In just one issue of the review, on the same page, on the same date, there were two art notices about Uncle Josh. Why two notices were published is not clear, but take note of something seen for the first time. In the notice on the left, Uncle Josh is playing at the Star Theater. In the notice at right, Uncle Josh is playing at, named for the very first time, the Romney Opera House. This is just one month after it opened. Note that here, Opera House is not capitalized, suggesting a description, not a name. An actual review of Uncle Josh. There was a large audience and no room to spare at the performance. Some things never change, sellouts are always good. This was a benefit performance for the Romney Band. The actors' performances were well received. Mita Workman was sedate and matronly, acting the part to perfection. Robert Baird, the hero, made love to the heroine in a manner that indicated experience in that line. <laughs> in the cast were James Workman. Could that be he who owned the theater? Note that here the place is still called the Star Theater. Maybe there were too many benefit performances, and eventually James Workman just wanted out. Back last September, he partnered with J.D. Blue. Now Wardman has sold his interest to Mr. Blue. Mr. Blue was a prominent man about town, but he is never again mentioned in connection with the theater. At the top, Romney Theater. At the bottom, it's called the New Opera House. Capitalized. Perhaps the forerunner of movie tone news, the Great War in Progress. The Million Dollar Mystery was a 23-chapter film serial released in 1914, directed by Howell Hansel and starring Florence Labedi and James Cruz. It was based on a book you could buy at the Mercantile. Today we call this cross-merchandising. Sorry, you can't see the film today. It is presumed lost. This is it, the very first display ad for the Opera House, December 8, 1950. A lot of people, including myself, for a long time thought that this was the ad that announced the opening of the theater. Not so, as we have just seen. Let's take a close look at this ad. First of all, it seems pretty official. The name of the place is Opera House, not Star Theater. Not even just theater. Yet there are no images of the building with any name on it besides theater. There never was a display ad where the place was identified as theater with or without a name, such as Star Theater or Romney Theater. It was always just called the Opera House, at least until 1937. The headline film was Ghosts. We do know a lot about this film. It starred Henry B. Walthall, Mary Alden, and Loretta Blake. It was one of the first authentic horror movies. Produced by Majestic Motion Picture Company, its running time was 49 minutes. Its official release date was June 1915, so it took about six months for it to reach Romney. As for the plot, this film is a loose adaption of Henrik Ibsen's play in which inherited syphilis... Wait, what do you say? Yeah. And I said inherited syphilis. It seems the plot used syphilis as a metaphor for corruption. The basic theme is not explicit. This was 1915 after all. Walthall plays a rich writer who comes down with syphilis due to his constant partying. The disease eventually kills his wife and slowly leads him to madness. Actually, the dramatic structure of Ibsen's original play is lost in the rewrite for the movie. And most of Ibsen's political point is lost as well. Fans of the play will be pleased that we do get the sun, but also note that in the play, Ibsen's disturbing and emotionally challenging conclusion in which Oswald's suicide is actively assisted by his mother was considered too strong for the times. Instead, Oswald just drinks the poison by himself. No one lives happily ever after. Just the kind of film you'd want to be the premier attraction of a brand new theater operation. The Million Dollar Mystery continues. Actually, this was a weekly serial that lasted 23 or 24 weeks. This week it was joined by the film Paid with Interest. This was a short drama starring Robert Harmon, uh, May Marsh, and Raoul Walsh. Its original release date was November 1914, so it took more than a year to reach Romney. 
That was just for Tuesday. On Wednesday, there are three films shown for the honor of Baltina, the buried treasure, and a keystone comedy called Their Social Splash. Note how these three films were shown as one unit and marketed as 4,000 feet of high-class pictures. Thursday night was a Charlie Chaplin film called Doe and Dynamite. Let's take a closer look at that film. On the left is an advertisement for the film. Note the shape of the image. The name of the production company is Keystone. On the right is a poster for the film. The plot of this 33-minute comedy involved Chaplin and another waiter becoming bakers when the regular bakers go out on strike. Unfortunately, the striking bakers put a stick of dynamite into a slice of bread which is delivered to the counter, but it winds up in the oven and explodes. Just another comedy from Max Sennett. There's one sadly ironic item about this film. This is one of several Charlie Chaplin films that was to be shown at the New York Historical Society in September 2001. However, after the terrorist attacks on 9-11, the film was not shown because it ends with Charlie emerging from the rubble of a destroyed building. Hmm. Let's pause here to take a look at the technology of these films. Note on the left, film is measured in feet. 4,000 feet for the Wednesday film, 2,000 feet for the Thursday film. The million dollar mystery is not measured in feet, but in reels. What's a reel? Well, one reel would hold about 1,000 feet of 35 millimeter film. Silent film was projected at 16 frames per second, so 1,000 feet would be about 16 minutes and 40 seconds. Thus, 4,000 feet of film would last about 68 minutes. Two reels would last half that, or about 33 minutes. Note that in the early days, frames per second was not really standardized. It could vary uh, with the production company of 14, 16, or 18 frames per second. Moreover, with many film cameras still being hand-cranked, the cameraman might not be very precise in his cranking speed. Consequently, the developed film speed and the projection film speed might not match. That's what happened when you view some old films that seem to run fast. <laughs> Tuesday, April 25th, the final episode of The Million Dollar Mystery. The new serial is The Girl in the Game, which would run for 15 weeks. You've heard of that old silent film serial where the beautiful heroine is tied to the railroad tracks by the villain, who's always dressed in black. She's saved at the last moment by her hero, who's always dressed in white, just as the train comes around the bend. The Girl in the Game may not be that specific film, but check out these chapter headings. Week 1, Helen's Race with Death. Week 2, The Winning Jump. Week 3, A Life in Peril. Week 4, Helen's Perilous Escape. And on it goes, on and on, for 15 weeks. Uh-oh, smallpox comes to Romney. Parts of town are quarantined. No church on Sunday, schools closed for a week, and the moving picture theater was closed by order of the Board of Health. The Opera House managers, Doman and Lutz, Alts, Ulitz at the time, tried to reassure their audiences. We have put our Opera House in a perfectly sanitary condition by fumigation, etc., and will not allow anyone to enter it who has been exposed to any infectious or contagious disease, so everyone may feel safe in coming here. What year is that? Um, what could possibly nine, go wrong? <laughs> okay, quite. Um, okay, I'll come back to it, I'm not sure. Back in business, Christmas week is always big for theaters. 1919, The Legion of Death, and a short film by Fabi Arbuckle. <laughs> this very mysterious advertisement ran on page 4 of the March 19 issue. You have to look very closely to find the name of the film. It's Lest We Forget. That's pretty small type. And remember, this was not projected onto a screen. It was just an ad in the newspaper. Here is the regular ad on page 5. The image from the previous ad is not repeated here. You have to look carefully to discover that the film is about the sinking of the Lusitania. If you look closely at this, it appears to be the stern of the ship as it's going down. This ran twice in this week's paper, on page one and again on page five. The management of the Opera House personally guarantees 
His Majesty the American, the super special attraction that will be offered on Saturday afternoon and night as being one of the best and biggest motion pictures that has ever been brought in any city. Not many theaters actually guarantee one of their films is one of the best or offer refunds. Can't get an ad much plainer than this. Note that only actors are names, named, not the films that they appear in. <laughs> Tom Mix, huh? As we've seen, it's not just movies that the theater presented. There were live performances of dramas and vaudeville. Let's take a closer look. While movies were the predominant business of the Opera House, the theater did frequently offer plays and vaudeville. In doing so, it did what many theaters of the era did. This week in January 1916 featured the regular run of pictures as well as vaudeville acts given by the Colvin Company, a high-class company of seven actors and actresses. There are hypnotic exhibitions, songs, dances, short sketches, etc. that will be amusing and entertaining. It was good business. What was the entertainment industry like in the early 1920s? There was no Netflix, no CBS All Access, no internet at all, no television. And the radio industry was in its infancy. There was theater, either performers live on stage or on film. From 1896 until about 1921, there was an annual series of books called the Julius Kahn Official Theatrical Guide. This was a series of books prepared for the hundreds of theatrical companies that traveled across the U.S. and for the managers of the thousands of theaters across the land. How many theaters were there in 1921? According to the Kahn book for that year, there were 20,006 theaters showing movies, and 3,673 theaters for live theater and vaudeville around the country. As small as it was, the Romney Opera House actually was included in at least one of the yearly editions. In the 1921 supplement volume, the Opera House was listed twice. On top is its listing for traveling shows, and on the bottom is its listing for films. Two things of note here. One, the seating capacity is shown as 400. We'll talk more about this number of seats shortly. Also note that the manager is first named H.A. A. Duncan, and then he's named H.A. A. Doman. Duncan is a mistake. The man's name was Doman. So here we have another vaudeville company. This night's presentation is the Harmony Coeds, a company of four young ladies, each a talented artist, presenting high-class vaudeville in Lyceum Entertainment that will consist of character impersonation, readings, vocal, and instrumental solos. And management insists, seldom is it possible for us to secure a traveling company which can qualify with the capacity of that of the Harmony Coeds. And here we have John Vogel's Big Fun Show, the largest and best show that ever played at this theater. Admission to all, children and adults alike, $1.10. That's a lot of money. It played a good audience, but not as large as the character the performance deserved. At $1.10, no wonder. Here we get to see the type of acts being presented. Magic, juggling, musical acts, tumbling, heavy balancing, trapeze acts, contortionists, sketches, and songs. There's something for children and even a film. If you ever saw the Broadway shows Gypsy or Will Rogers Follies, you know that vaudeville performers were always hoping to break into the big time circuit. The biggest of the big was the Palace Theater in New York, but all big cities had at least one big time house. Then there was the middle time and of course the small time circuits, playing the smallest towns and the smallest theaters. I don't know how small was small, but I searched the American Vaudeville Museum archives as well as other potential sources, the Colvin Company, the Harmony Coeds, Schrenner and Schrenner, none of them are included in any of those databases. Besides showing films and importing various stage acts, the Opera House frequently presented local talent. Sometimes local people were temporarily added to the cast of a touring show. Sometimes a local production would be presented at the theater. The theater was also used for community meetings and other events. Here a group performs as a benefit for the Junior Guild of St. Stephen's Church. The entire cast is listed in the notice. We've seen this ad before. It's the one that ran after the smallpox event. 
but now look down at the bottom. For the upcoming play, The Slacker, management says one cent on each admission for the show will be given to the Red Cross. Well, a week later, note at the very bottom, the management will give two cents on each admission to the Daughters of the Confederacy on this night's receipts instead of one cent to the Red Cross as stated last week. <laughs> but beginning with Monday, June 3rd, one cent on each adult ticket will be given to the Red Cross during the month of June. So perhaps Red Cross did better because they had a full month's worth of receipts than they would have otherwise. Here we have students from Romney High School presenting the play The Private Secretary. Of unusual interest, it was first presented at the Opera House, then a mini tour to Moorfield. Sometimes the Opera House was used for things that were completely unrelated to entertainment. Here the house was used to discuss the building of a new courthouse. If you can see up here, um, the new courthouse. And used for speeches by politicians, so long as they are non-political. What? Yeah. <laughs> non-political. Note the bottom advisory. All, of course, including women, are invited to hear them. <laughs> Another Romney High School production. Mrs. Temple's Telegram was the annual junior play. The Red Cross used the space too. On this, on this occasion, a representative of the Tuberculosis League of West Virginia and the associate manager of the Potomac Division of the American Red Cross made presentations. After the speeches came the election of officers for the local chapter. Another benefit, this time for the Daughters of the Confederacy, who will show the picture Conrad in Quest of His Youth. Note that many of these benefits took place on Monday nights. Mondays are typically slow days in theaters, so using the theater for a benefit on Mondays was probably not a big deal for the theater. <coughs> 1922, the Potomac State School Dramatic Club included an impersonation of Burt Williams. Down here. And another benefit for the Junior Guild of St. Stephen's Church. Students from Kaiser traveled all the way to Romney to do a show. <clears throat> Evidently, St. Stephen's found doing shows at the Opera House was quite lucrative. Here, the womanless wedding. The title probably meant something different in 1923 than it might today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Note that few of these benefit performances ever showed up in the weekly advertisements. In this full page length ad, the womanless wedding is not mentioned at all. This ad, which you can't begin to read any of it, of course, uh, was the full length of the newspaper page, top to bottom. Oh dear, remember the Romney band? Out of business, instruments for sale. <laughs> The Little Clodhopper was another benefit for the Ladies Aid Society of the ME Church South. It was one of the best amateur productions ever seen here and was enjoyed by a crowded house. Then a week later, it came back by popular demand. We'll take a quick look at the people who actually ran the theater. Recall this notice from earlier that J.D. Blue had purchased the theater, but he immediately turned it over to Sam Yankelwitz and David Shear. Sam has never heard from again. It's David Shear, front and center. With this very first display ad, David is shown right at the top as manager. Shear seems to be an aggressive promoter. Here he has made arrangements with Paramount Pictures to present full-length films, secured at considerable expense, but we are determined that our patrons shall have the best pictures that can be secured. It only took about two years, but now David Shear is the proprietor of the Opera House. But alas, not for much longer than a year. World War I, the Great War, intervened. David either enlisted or was drafted, but he had to leave the theater. 
In his two years at the Opera House, it was said, no more popular young man lives here, and with him will go the good wishes of the entire community. Young man, when David was named as manager of the Opera House, he was 19 years old. David joined the Army. While overseas, he managed to keep in touch with news from Romney. Remember the smallpox? He wrote of his concerns about that problem. I was sorry to hear that the Opera House was under quarantine in a few other places, but I hope the quarantine won't last long. When David returned from the war, he came back to Romney, but he never returned to the Opera House. He opened his own clothing store. But home was home, the store was across the street from the Opera House. By the way, David went on to be a prominent citizen of Romney, eventually becoming mayor. You've seen this picture, but do you see Shear's store? Let's zoom in. Right here, Shear's clothing store. You may have never noticed the sign before, or knew that Shear had once managed the theater. By 1918, a new manager enters, H.A. Doman, not Duncan, as we saw in the Julius Kahn Guide. And by 1920, the theater had been open for five years, yet it had to announce that it would soon be showing better motion picture productions than ever before. They did admit, however, occasionally they would have to raise the prices for good shows. Doman was a promoter. Here's an announcement of a deal for films from the famous Players Lasky Corporation. That was an American motion picture and distribution company created in 1916 for the merger of Adolf Zucker's famous Players Film Company and the Jesse L. Lasky Feature Play Company. The company eventually became the most dominant film production company and theater-owning company in the country, and it was eventually sued on antitrust grounds. It lost. Doman stuck around for about seven years. He hired John M. Snar to replace him. The torch was passed to Snar, and here he said he hoped to do as good a job as the patrons were used to. Now we're going to take a look at the theater itself, the building, the structure, the venue. Once again, this is the picture everyone knows about. At the time this picture was taken, the place was already known as the Alpine Theater, but that's a topic for part two. Right now, let's just take a look at the building itself. We begin by taking a close look at the theater entrance. There was a slight slope to the street at that location, but that would not require three steps up to the entrance. So why have a raised entrance? Because by raising the entrance, you raise the lobby and you raise the back of the house, the seating area. If you do that, then you do not have to excavate the front of the seating area in order to get more slope in that seating area. Behind the signboard in the center, there's no doubt a box office. On either side are two entrances into the theater. Here. Uh, most notably and most unusually are two staircases on either side of the entrance in the corners. You can just barely make them out in this light. Um, almost certainly these stairs go up to a balcony. Exterior stairs such as these were somewhat common when balconies were segregated with separate entrances and stairways so blacks and whites never mixed inside the theater. But never was there a notice or an advertisement that supports this theory. There never was an ad that listed separate prices for a balcony. The fact is, there is no documentation to support the likelihood that there was any balcony at all. More than one person I've spoken with remembers a balcony, but no one says they ever went up there. Of course, if the theater was segregated, that makes sense. There was a balcony. There was a balcony. <laughs> but not if the balcony was open to all. Yeah, we know that. We've been there. We've been to this. Well, I want to talk to you later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But again, um, the limited documentation is to really try and narrow it down to support that with actual contemporaneous um, indications. And we'll talk more about it in just a, just a minute or two. Um, well, so what do we know about the inside of the theater? Almost nothing at all, but perhaps I'm about to learn something. Uh, there are no known photographs of the interior, no newspaper descriptions, no contemporary public comments. There are some things we can surmise, and a few people around town have some recollection of the place. 
We know it had a stage, it had to, because of all the theater and vaudeville. There are two sections of seats alongside a center of aisle. There were ushers who wore uniforms. The seats were probably just wood without cushions, although we know that they were replaced from time to time. There were restrooms, women on the left, men on the right. There was a curtain covering the movie screen, which was dramatically opened when the movie started. Let's go back to this view. Have you ever seen such an odd assortment of windows? We can only guess what was happening on each floor, but those would be educated guesses. On the second level was either an intermediate landing between the stairs that go on up to the balcony, or there are windows for the manager's offices. The large windows in what would seem to be the third floor were no doubt windows of a balcony lobby or landing. That would mean that there were also doors from this upper lobby into the house, as it would be necessary to have a light lock during the day. The small windows on the top floor were probably for the projection booth. Curtains in the windows suggest that shutting out the light was important there too. Now let's walk around the theater on the outside. In this image, note the window on the left side of the building. And in this image, note the window on the right side of the building, which is just barely made out. From their location, they might have been windows inside the house, heavily blacked out, no doubt. There could be windows in the balcony lobby, but for a theater this size, that would make that lobby too large. Instead, they might be back of the balcony. There's no orchestra pit, right? We do not know of an orchestra pit. In the foreground is the Romney Diner. The large building next to it is the Marble Works. And this is the corner of the back of the theater. And you just barely make out, there's a window up here from, the, uh, from that part of the theater building. A window in the back wall of the theater at that height can only be there for a couple of reasons. It could be a window and a dressing room, but little we know about the stage does not suggest there is room for a lot of dressing rooms. Normally, a stage ceiling would go all the way to the roof, so a dressing room in that location doesn't make any sense anyway. Another reason for a window in an upstage wall that high is when there is a fly loft that upper portion of a stage where scenery is flown. The window there would be next to a fly floor, the place where stagehands work the flies. But without flying scenery, there would be no fly floor, so no need for a window there. Still, some of the vaudeville included trapeze acts, so we just don't know. One thing is certain, most contemporary theaters of this size were simply too small to support such a feature. Just a year after opening, a new projector was needed. And a review of the new projector saying it's doing a good job. This ad is a very big deal because it is the only original information available about the number of seats in the theater, 350. Note there's no identification of a balcony price. If the prices were the other way around, say, 250 seats at 35 cents and 100 at 25 cents, that might suggest a balcony at being the cheaper seats. But as is, no theater would have 100 seats on the floor and 250 seats in a balcony. Of course, all 350 seats might have been on one level. Recall that in the 1921 Julius Kahn book, the seating capacity was shown at 400. The theater will soon install 300 and some odd opera chairs, regular type with arms. This will greatly add to the comfort of the moviegoers and thereby fill a long needed want by both the patrons and manager. Of note, Mr. Doman, the manager, advises that the chairs he purchased are second hand, although they are practically new. Remember the earlier complaint about heating? Here Mr. Doman also announces that they have been figuring out, figuring out installing an up-to-date heating system for the coming winter. But whether this proposition will be too expensive to bear out for the present has not been fully decided upon. We don't know if they ever fixed the heating system, but the following summer they added a couple of high power fans to cool the place. This is the only time a glass enclosed lobby is mentioned. We have no images of that. Exactly where the glass wall was located is not known. But now we do know they served popcorn. (laughs) 
No pictures of a glass front, but here are grates in front of the entrance. We don't know anything about them. Not when, not why. Now we'll take a look at some of the common street scenes that include the theater. I'm sure you've seen most of them before. The picture we saw earlier with the Shears <coughs> clothing store. This is the same picture as the image with the grates blocking the entrance. One can argue that this is the oldest known photograph of the theater. There are several reasons for this thought. First, this is the only image ever seen that does not have the word theater painted on the front. Not there. The street is not paved, but we can narrow, but can we narrow down the date? The advertisement on the side of the restaurant is for endless caverns. Those caverns did not open to the public until 1920, so it's not before that. The cupola in the background is on the new courthouse, which was built in 1922. The name of the restaurant is already Green Palm, but on the other side of the argument is that the Romney Mercantile was still in business as of 1924. I have not yet found a date for the opening of the Green Palm, so at least the image is uh, not before 1924. This is almost identical to the previous picture, but now the word theater is prominently displayed. The street is paved and the sidewalk in front of the restaurant is lower than the street. One source for this picture of the Parker Hotel says it was taken from the roof of the theater. I suspect it was taken from the side window of the theater. A wide view of the town. Can you spot the theater? No. There's the courthouse, and over here is the theater. All throughout the 1920s, even into the 1930s, it was business as usual for the Opera House. Here, vaudeville, feature films, and a serial. But in 1927, something revolutionary happened to the movie industry. Talkies. It took a couple of years for that to affect the Opera House, but affect it, they did. In fact, the transition from silent films to film with sound was very swift. By 1931, well, see what it says on the bottom. This will be the last picture to be shown in this house for some time. For the record, the last silent films to ever be shown in the Opera House were The Great Devil, Adventures of Tarzan, and Speed. The Great Devil starred Jack Perrin, Lorraine Eason, and Tom London. It was a five-reel picture, so it ran about 83 minutes. One week later, the Opera House is again closed for the reason that silent pictures cannot anymore be secured and the room is not equipped for sound pictures. It does seem that a place the size of Romney should find some way in which this condition could be remedied. Other theaters in other towns managed to make the transition. Here, the Palace Theater in Winchester and the Music Hall in Kaiser uh, made the transition. Both theaters advertising in the Hampshire Review. Hmm. Eventually the opera, opera House was sold. The ideal theater took over. Remodeled, refitted, and sound installed. The ideal theater opened on September 30, 1932. So this is where we stop tonight. We're going to have to stay tuned for the next installment, date to be determined. <laughs> Uh, I want to give thanks and credits to a lot of people. Um, and so that's where we're at. Any questions, thoughts, complaints? Thank you. A lot of work. What about what the inside is like? So, so um, you were there. The, 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 floor, the, the floor had a big slant to it. You went up, all, up steps to get in the theater, and then you went down, and the, 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 the stage was down ground level. 
and there's law seats in there. The balcony upstairs, uh, right below. Um, and so that's where we're at. Any questions, thoughts, complaints? So, um, you were there. Uh, the, 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 floor, the, the floor had a big slant to it. You went up, up, up steps to get in the theater, and then you went down, and the, 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 the stage is down ground level, and there's a lot of seats in there. The balcony upstairs, uh, right below the uh, projector room, and it's reserved for car people. That's where they had to sit. And uh, I can remember some movies, the silent movies. I can't remember the, the, the author, or I mean the actor, but he was well known at the time. And, uh, and, I, can re and I remember when the, sign, sound, the sound first, they first got sound. There's a lot of movies, Tarzan movies back early, and uh, uh, can't think of any. They had a lot of comedies, and they had a newsreel. They had the comedies, newsreels, and the feature. And you, I think you get in Saturday afternoon, matinee for 10 cents. This is back in the, probably the 30s, early 30s. And, uh, I, I I just can't re recall too many other things about it. But Did you see it. any shows? What's that? Any shows? Did you see any shows? Live performances. Oh, you mean shows? Live performances. Live? I, I probably, I might have seen one way back, yeah, in the late 20s. Seen live shows. But I do remember being in there when they had something else. I mean, somebody on the stage, and I, don't, I can't remember what it was. Was it a meeting, of, you know, some kind of meeting or what? But, but uh, was it a real tall ceiling? Yeah, the ceiling is real tall, very tall. Yeah, yeah. And the windows could have been for ventilation. There's no AC, you know. So, light and ventilation. What's the use of the building now? Oh. 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 What, what, what's that? Did they have ushers? What's that? Did they have ushers? Ushers? That I can't remember. Not that I know of. Did you remember the ushers, Bonnie? No. Yeah. They turned it into the bowling alley. Ah. Thank you. Other thoughts, recollections? Uh, Gary said they turned it into a bowling alley after World War II. I've heard that, and that's one of the topics we'll be looking into for part two. We'll find out for sure. But there was a usher or and ticket takers. What? And ticket and ticket takers. A ticket. I don't know. I don't remember about that, but I still remember the usher. I just wanted to tell you, if you'll check the, uh, on Hampshire, historichampshire.org, the Keller Hotel registers, there was a circus in 1855 and another one in 1858 that came to town. And all of their names are in the register as performers. So that'll give you a little bit more entertainment. Other thoughts, memories, questions, complaints? Mm -hmm. I'm hearing shattered here, so some people must have a little bit. Like this one right here. I don't know what to say. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, all right, um, I think we can wrap it up. So, thank you all very much for coming, and um, I, again, I, as I said at the very beginning, this is a work in progress, and I want to get back to some of you who have offered comments tonight. 
and try and fill in some of these blanks because there are big mysteries still about this whole process, whole project. So um, thank you very much. Carol? Awesome. This is great. I will tell you that I was way in the back and I wish that I could have read all those little things. So I don't know whether Ken is going to be able to peek at some of those and put them on the video so that we can read them or whether you will yeah. share them. We'll, we'll yeah. work it out. We'll, we'll, work we'll out. do the best we can with, okay. with what we got to work with. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so I got to pin you down on when you're coming back to do the Alpine Theater. Do you want to say anything tonight no. about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be determined. Our next Romney on the menu is not going to be here. It's going to be at the Meitinger House in March. It will be Saturday the 28th from 3 to 4.30. Now there's other things going on in town, so if you want to come to the Women's Club vendor show from 9 to 4, that's going on over at the Bottling Works. Co-op always has something going on. And then stay in town a little bit and do the Mighty Girl House, the uh, Dr. Hot and Daddy Addis Hot are going to be giving us a tour and um, share stories, so that'll be wonderful. What are the times of the afternoon again? 3 to 4.30. Thank you. And you all know where the Mighty Girl House is next to Taggart Hall? Okay. Woodrow Wilson, Meidinger. Complex. Complex. Yes, because it's multiple buildings. Yes, it is. Okay. Any other, any other questions for Rick at this moment in time? Or comments? Do you remember anything? Do you have any photos in your albums and your attics? If you do, I know he would love to have the opportunity to copy them. Okay. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Anybody want to do a presentation, share some history? The uh, projector room, and it's reserved for car people. That's where they had to sit. And uh, I can remember some movies, the silent movies. I can't remember the, the, the author, or I mean the actor, but he was well known at the time. And uh, and I can, re and I remember when the sign, sound, the sound first, they first got sound. And there's a lot of movies, Tarzan movies back early, and I uh, uh, can't think of any. They had a lot of comedies, and they had a newsreel. They had the comedies, newsreels, and the feature. And you, I think you'd get in Saturday afternoon, matinee for 10 cents. This is back in the, probably the 30s, early 30s. And uh, I, I, I just can't re recall too many other things about it. But Did you see it. any shows? What's that? Any shows? Did you see any shows? Live performances. Oh, you mean shows? Live performances. Live? I, I probably, I might have seen one way back, yeah in the late 20s. But I do remember being in there when they had something else. I mean, somebody on the stage. And I, don't, I can't remember what it was. Was it a meeting, of, you know, some kind of meeting or what? But, but uh, Was it a real tall ceiling? Yeah. yeah, the ceiling is real tall. Very tall, yeah. yeah. And the windows could have been for ventilation. There's no AC or anything. You know. And the windows could have been for ventilation. There's no AC, you know. So, Light the ventilation. What's the use of the building now? Oh. 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 Okay. All right. Um, I think we can wrap it up. So, thank you all very much for coming. And um, I, again, I, as I said at the very beginning, this is a work in progress. And I want to get back to some of you who have offered comments tonight and try and fill in some of these blanks because there are big mysteries still about this whole process, whole project. So, um, thank you very much, Carol.